Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, first, thank you all for, for coming. And uh, we've got a pretty full room here. That's great uh, because this is certainly a topic that is of uh, great interest to a number of people. And uh, I hope that I can add some insights that will be beneficial to you today. I, I first want to thank Yu Shin uh, for the privilege of being able to come and, and to speak today uh, during this excellent conference that is ongoing. We had an excellent morning. And uh, this midday mid session, I think, will add to it. And then there will be more that happens this afternoon as well. Um, I want to thank Carl Eikenberry also, a, a great patriot and leader uh, who has served uh, our nation with distinction and many different positions of great responsibility, uh, retiring as a three-star general, but also serving as an ambassador, a classic illustration of the warrior statesman. And uh, it's, it's an honor to be able to share the stage with you this afternoon. Uh, I have to thank Heather Ahn also. Heather Ahn is a, a work-in-the-background kind of person, but she's the one who got me out here. So, Heather, thank you very much for your assistance <laughs> and hard work. Well, I'm actually retired now. I uh, retired on the 1st of January this year, 2019, so I'm just a few months into retirement and trying to figure out what that actually means. And this is an academic institution, so I think I'm probably getting a, a C minus or a D in retirement at this point by remaining perhaps a bit more active than, uh, than I thought I would when I looked at retirement and contemplated it. Uh, but that came at the end of uh, really 42 years of service having walked into the U.S. Military Academy in 1976, and it culminated with that tremendous opportunity and assignment in Korea, as Gyu Shin described, in those three positions, those three hats three very important commands over all of the U.S. forces in Korea, over the combined forces of the Republic of Korea and the United States. And that's somewhere on the order of 625 to 628,000 troops in a time of war. And then finally, uh, the commander of uh, the very old now United Nations Command established in 1950. And it was a tremendous privilege, I, I have to tell you that. So let me uh, do a few things here in the, the short amount of time we have for opening remarks. Uh, we want to really get to the conversation between myself and uh, General Eikenberry, as well as uh, interacting with all of you who may have questions uh, that you want to share with me. I, I want to say that I, I've spent about five and a half years of duty in Korea during my career. That's two different assignments, and both of them were in command positions, positions of responsibility. Uh, and I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot about Korea. I learned a lot about the envir environment, the culture, uh, what it is that motivates people in different ways, and certainly uh, the fact that it was a second time gave me some advantages. And so Gyu Shin was very kind to describe me as, uh, as being admired and respected in South Korea. Uh, but trust me, the feeling is mutual. So I, I certainly have a great love for the Republic of Korea and my service there. I was, uh, for a period of time, operating without an ambassador. And I think that will become important as we talk about what cir circumstances and considerations we had to go through in the years 2016 to 2018. About 30 months of time there. 15 of those months were without a senior civilian in the position of ambassador in the Republic of Korea. And that uh, then demanded an approach from me as a military commander, which may be seen as not traditional, but was necessary at the time. That was to stretch beyond military considerations into the other considerations that represented both nations, as well as the countries that were part of the United Nations Command. When I say both nations, I mean the Republic of Korea and the, the United States of America, since I was a, a commander working for both presidents <coughs> in that point in time. Uh, what I learned from my time there, frankly, is that there are always opportunities and there are also always challenges. And we can't be hindered just by the challenges and thus avoid the opportunities. Nothing will change. Things might get worse. There has to be a, a willingness and a courage to try uh, to pursue the opportunities. And, and that's really what we did. And I'll tell you that uh, as, a, uh, as a retiree, I recently moved into a new house and it's got a large yard, and I find myself having to do a lot of trimming the bushes and bringing the hedges down and clearing brush and that sort of thing. And it occurred to me as I was flying out here yesterday, that's kind of like the situation in Korea. 
there's a lot of brush and undergrowth that has happened over these many, many years of the Republic of Korea, United States relationship, and certainly in the longer issues of North Korea, South Korea relations, Korea, Japan, Russia, China relations, regional relations. And every now and then you have to trim back the brush in order to see what is good and to keep it alive and flourishing. And so much of the work that uh, is ongoing right now, I would say, is in that category of clearing out the brush. So I want you to have that as a frame of reference as I, as I talk to you about some of my observations and, uh, and, and quickly uh, expose those to you. So right up front, let me talk about the summit, the most recent second U.S.-North Korea summit that occurred in Hanoi. And I'll just give you a couple of quick shots on how I view that. And this is my own opinion. You should understand that as we go in. First thing, here's what the summit showed. Kim Jong-un, the leader in North Korea, the chairman, is not agile when he's under pressure. He was perhaps surprised at the way things turned during the summit, and he was unable to maneuver. That's important. It's both in a disadvantage for him, perhaps, but it's an, it's an opportunity for those who work with him to find ways to help him continue to move because he has to maneuver in order for there to be change. So that's the first thing. He was not agile. The second thing, <coughs> th second thing is that Kim Jong-un values economic de development more than he values nuclear weapons. And I realize that uh, not everyone will agree with me on that. Some will say that the nuclear weapons are the basis for his future existence. I don't believe that's the case. I think he values economic development and being the one to deliver North Korea's economic development more than he does nuclear weapons. And he will trade off nuclear weapons for economic development. Of course, he would desire to have both. That's very clear from his, his plan of 2016 where he was going to pursue both the weapons development program and economic development as a dual track to bring North Korea forward. But by engaging in the weapons uh, developments, he essentially foreclosed the economic development. And now he's down to the choice of which one do I keep. And so given the right amount of pressure and the right basis for decision, Kim Jong-un, in my view, will give up the nuclear weapons. He has said he would do that, and we'll have to see whether he will or will not. Lots of reason to not believe what I just said. So trust me, I'm with you on that. <laughs> but we have to look for what is possible and pursue the opportunities, not be thwarted by the challenges when they show up. So I'll just share that with you as a thought. Uh, I would say to you that Kim Jong-un, and perhaps more broadly North Korea, does not want to rely on China for anything. Don't view them as friends. China already has control over more than 90% of the North Korean economy. That is not an impressive economy. If China really wanted to help, they could have done so a long time ago, and they've done very little for North Korea through the years. I think that's a reality we have to take stock of. That may account for why there was such a long train trip and not a borrowed airplane for the second summit, because there were borrowed aircraft the first time. The Chinese were very kind to borrow that. What kind of branding is that then for the North Korean leader to land somewhere in Asia, in Singapore in that case, and step off of a Chinese aircraft? rather to take a long train trip than to signal any kind of reliance on China. I think that's an important takeaway that has to not be walked past. It has to be considered in everything else that's done because much of what's going on has to do with China, not just with the United States and North Korea relationship. I, I would say also, as we're just taking some snapshots from the summit, it's my belief that Kim Jong-un underestimated President Trump and overestimated what he perceived as President Trump being in a desperate situation. He guessed wrong on that. Uh, sometimes uh, in other countries, U.S. dynamics, U.S. activities are very visible. I saw, I saw that in nearly every country that I served in around the world. They watch very closely what's happening in the United States. But often countries will project that into their own understanding of how their own politics will work. And therefore, they may believe that there was desperation on the part of the United States president. They guessed wrong. There wasn't. 
there wasn't. And as a result, the President of the United States could walk away from a deal and not be desperate about having it brought to closure at that point in time. The next observation I would share with you is that the Republic of Korea has demonstrated that it knows how to lower the tension with North Korea. And I can tell you that when I came into command in 2016, it didn't look like that. It looked more like tension was rising and we were concerned at that point in time that South Korea would take some sort of preemptive action against North Korea, having been attacked by North Korea several times, uh, most recently the Chonan incident in 2010 and the shelling of Yongpyong Island uh, as well, both of which resulted in losses of life. And so that has changed. South Korea, under President Moon Jae-in, has found ways to lower tension and create opportunities for dialogue and move things in a different direction toward diplomacy and away from military activity. So very important to understand. I believe that because of that, because South Korea has demonstrated their ability to do that, the U.S. should listen more to the perspective of South Korea. Does it mean that the U.S. and South Korea have to fundamentally agree on everything? I would say that having been a commander in an alliance, managing the alliance is very important to both countries, preserving it, keeping it strong. But there are two different perspectives in that alliance, like in a good marriage. It's two different perspectives, two different views of how to address a particular problem and achieve a commonly accepted end. There's two different sets of ways. And the ways have to be acknowledged that sometimes one of the other partners is right. So I, I would submit that the U.S. has to make sure that it's open to the methods that South Korea has learned. And then we, that there's capitalizing on the capabilities of both countries. The U.S. with its global leadership, especially its ability to impact things uh, in the global economic sphere. And South Korea's ability to understand the culture and know how to move things forward. That's a powerful combination that stands up against North Korea. It's very challenging for North Korea to work through when those two are well coordinated. The last thing is that uh, Kim Jong-un lost face during this most recent summit. He didn't come back with what he wanted. And indeed, with these miscalculations, might even be embarrassed. And in Asia, before there's going to be another step, there's going to be a face-saving move by Kim Jong-un. Now, what that move is, we don't know, whether it's uh, this demonstrating that we can resume missile launches at any point in time, as we uh, heard from Che Son hee just in the last few days, uh, his vice foreign minister, or it, whether it's something else, whether it's something stronger internally for North Korea, that's not clear, but he'll do something to try to equalize what he believes now is a positional disadvantage. And we should be looking for that and not be surprised or disappointed when it comes, but rather to put it in context, which is it's his cultural imperative to do that before he can move forward or come back to a negotiating table. Okay, just a couple of thoughts in on, on what 2016 to 18 looked like uh, from my eyes in those seats that I was uh, fulfilling. I, I used to, hear about Korea being the land of the morning calm. And it does have beautiful mornings, you know, with fog in the valleys and the, the countless hills. There's always another hill in Korea. But the experience told us it was really the land of the morning surprise. <laughs> because nearly every day there is something. And, and quite candidly, uh, this is not just attributed to North Korea. This is a bit of a three-way dance where the United States and North Korea are touching one another. North Korea and South Korea are touching one another. And South Korea and the United States are touching one another. And all three are maneuvering and dancing together at the same time, with tension being put on each one of those three relationships and with some outside players around those three, Russia, China, Japan especially, making it even more difficult to do the dance among the three. So every day it seemed that there was a new surprise coming from one of those players. A Washington surprise, a Seoul surprise, a Pyongyang surprise. And when you thought you had one part of it settled, something else would come loose. When I first came into command, of course, we had in the United States, President Obama, 
and in the Republic of Korea, the uh, President Park Geun-hye. And at the time, it seemed, as I mentioned, that North, uh, South Korea was much more likely to engage in a preemptive action. And much of our energy was spent to make sure that, that didn't happen within the alliance, that there was always going to be an alliance decision and that there wouldn't be unilateral action that would create a sudden escalation, as we saw in 2015. That changed. That changed in the early spring of 2017 after elections in the United States, but after an impeachment in South Korea. And having been present for all of that uh, was quite an interesting journey. But as that change occurred, it was a different consideration. It was far more likely, at least in the minds of the South Koreans, that the U.S. might engage in a preemptive action, that South Korea didn't want to get drawn into uh, a protracted conflict that would create great destruction in South Korea. And suddenly, how we ab addressed that dance was different. All the while, of course, North Korea was increasing its pace of testing. And whether you can characterize them as a provocation or not, and some would call them that, that they are deliberately done to provoke South Korea, Russia, China, Japan, and the United States, all five countries around North Korea. Others would say they were simply testing. Uh, but testing done in such a way that it created great concern internationally. In many ways, Kim Jong-un was trying to raise the visibility of the North Korean problem to the international stage and keep it there, which is something that his father and grandfather were not successful in doing. Even the Korean War was viewed as a conflict, not, a, not an outright war as it should have been. So it never reached that international crescendo that Kim Jong-un was able to achieve as he pursued and tested nuclear weapons twice during my time there. Two nuclear tests, the fifth and the sixth nuclear test. Uh, let me just say that uh, the, among the opportunities, there are many, but to pursue the opportunities that exist on finding a way through this nuclear problem, finding a way toward peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, the challenges are many. I think chief among them is the potential of missing signals. Because the cultures are so different, the Korean culture, the American culture, the Chinese, Japanese, and Russian cultures, they're so different, each one of them, that the signals that are being sent by any one of the players, especially those three who are involved in the close dance, are often missed. I'll give you an illustration of that that I, that I saw happen in my own experience. <coughs> in 2017, as we saw this quickening pace and the change of leadership in the Republic of Korea and the United States, it appeared that we were on a, a trajectory toward military conflict. All the while, our objective was actually to create a sufficient degree of pressure to make Kim Jong-un change his mind about how to pursue his ultimate aims and for him to choose diplomatic methods, not the military methods that were evident to him and being made into greater preparation. There came a time in the middle of 2017 where pressure was rising significantly. By about April 2017, we anticipated there were preparations for another nuclear test, a sixth nuclear test, in spite of the sanctions that had come in after the fifth and the fourth. That didn't happen, though, because the military pressure and the international cooperation also were rising. Military pressure increased significantly. We began to demonstrate capability in ways that North Korea had not seen before, showing them that, uh, that we can't have the same degree of comfort that he once had, that we would only go to a certain point and never go beyond. And that pattern had been well established by then. Instead, uh, Kim Jong-un went quiet relatively quiet for a period of time. And our own U.S. negotiators at the time were trying to just cool things down, as were the South Korean uh, leaders, try to cool things down for a period of time. Let's see if we can just get things quiet with no testing, no provocation for about 60 days. The U.S. perspective was that you have to tell us when you start those 60 days. Otherwise, it doesn't count. The North Korean approach was I, I – don't have that obligation to tell you anything, you should be able to see for yourself. And we went 78 days. 
and it didn't count. The signals were missed. North Korea was sending the signal that, okay, things are quieter now. We haven't done anything for 78 days. The U.S. said didn't count. Pressure was still high and went up further. The sixth nuclear test didn't happen. Right around the same time as the U.N. General Assembly and the rhetoric became much harsher during that 2017 U.N. General Assembly. Thereafter, though, we went another number of days until the 29th of November 2017, which was the final intercontinental ballistic missile test launch. The longest in its, du in its duration, it's the, it was able to range more of the United States than any of the other ones uh, before that, as well as all of the alliance partners of the United States. And some view that that was just one more step and a good reason to take it beyond that to military action. Others believe that Kim Jong-un was equalizing and, and, and resetting face and that a change would come very quickly. In a matter of hours, actually, after the launch that morning, a statement was put out saying he's gone as far as he needs to go. For many, that was not believable because of their pattern of behavior. But it is now 471 days since he said he was going in a different direction. Does it count? Do we acknowledge that there's a change or is our disbelief going to drive us into, it's just a matter of time before he begins to start again. It's 471 days where it has been true. So the potential of missing one another's signals is significant and is to me perhaps the greatest hazard in this entire process. Let me just close by, by saying that uh, all of us I think are, are trying to come to grips with what is the way ahead? How do you, how do you move forward from here after the most recent summit, by the way, the, the summit scores are now four to three to two to zero, zero. That would be four that China has had with Kim Jong-un, that Xi Jinping has had with Kim Jong-un. Three that Moon Jae-in, president of South Korea, has had with uh, uh, Kim Jong-un. Two that President Trump has had with Kim Jong-un. Zero that Russia has had, zero that Japan has had. Both of whom have stated a desire to meet with North Korea, but the timing is not right yet for that. So this season of summitry has, uh, has blossomed in many ways, but what is the way forward from here? For the U.S., I would submit that the U.S. should recognize that it actually does have a strong position right now and that for change to occur, the U.S., as the stronger power, will need to stand in the open door. You can't stand behind it. You can't just say it's unlocked because that signal will be missed somehow standing in the open door and making it very clear that dialogue can continue will be required. The second is that there has to be continued engagement. The potential of misunderstanding one another is so great and guaranteed, really. The only way to work through misunderstanding on things like that is through dialogue, direct dialogue. And that we have channels of dialogue puts us in a far better condition in 2019, even with a summit that didn't end well, a far better condition than we were in 2017 when there was no dialogue and an escalating condition. So that has to be capitalized on as a tremendous opportunity to resolve and clarify and, don't think on, and to not be disappointed when we find that we didn't get the outcomes we wanted. The third thing that I would submit to you is for the way ahead is we need to increase sanctions. The cost of achieving economic development has to go up as a result of Hanoi. Does it need to be as full a set as the previous 11? Not necessarily. But by gambling on getting all or six of the 11 relieved in exchange for Young Beyond Nuclear Research and Development Facility uh, being externally inspected, in exchange for that, that was not a good deal in the, the mind of the President of the United States. The cost has to go up. So more sanctions are probably needed. And, and North Korea will understand that, believe it or not. They may say, how can you impose sanctions and be expressing a desire to have a friendly new relationship? They understand the duality of that. There needs to be a, an economic development plan that is created now. South Korea has some desire for that. It needs to be much broader, though, than 
the local north-south exchanges that are being contemplated. It has to be an international economic development plan for North Korea. And that planning by itself exposes to North Korea that there is a serious potential for them if they maneuver correctly toward denuclearization. And if they don't, that will be unfulfilled potential, and they can see it materialize. So economic development planning beginning now to be implemented later when conditions have been set and those conditions have to be discussed and concluded is part of what needs to occur. And then finally, uh, there needs to be a reassurance for the Republic of Korea and Japan especially who are most affected by this. South Korea is the most affected truly and Japan would be second most affected by the circumstances. There has to be reassurance that this is moving it is different than before, and it can end up in the right direction. And we should seek the counsel, especially of South Korea, on how to do that. So I, I remain somewhat optimistic about uh, the opportunities. That's just the way I'm wired. I, I tend to be more opportunistic than pessimistic. And that uh, there, there can be a way toward peace and stability in Korea and in the broader region, but it's going to require greater creativity greater empathy, and a greater collective engagement in order to get to that. So with that, I, I thank you for your time. Hope that gets you started, and maybe we'll prompt some questions, and I look forward to the uh, conversation with Carl Eikenberry here. So thank you again very much.